Chapter 31, American Life in the Roaring Twenties, 1919-1929. Let's get started. Two key points. First of all, modernism and consumerism come to replace progressivism as we transition into the 1920s. And secondly, various conflicts exist throughout the Roaring Twenties in American culture and America in general. Those conflicts are popular culture versus morals and norms, uh, racial tension, religion versus science, urban versus rural, and a generational conflict that certainly coincides with all of that, especially popular culture versus morals and norms. Following the First World War, the United States experiences its first of two Red Scares, and from 1919 to 1920, we are on a national crusade of sorts against people whose Americanism was suspect. And Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, to some extent, is leading that charge as he rounded up people who were in question, uh, suspected communists, for example, and did deport them. In 1919 and 1920, there were criminal syndicalism laws, which did make it illegal to advocate the use of violence in order to obtain social change. And there's also a push for this American plan, which favors the open shop over a closed shop in the workplace. A closed shop would be a scenario where workers would have to be a member of the union in order to be employed there. And again, strikers are seen as communist and un-American, so there's a real effort to advocate for the open shop. Here is Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. And here are some folks he has supposedly sent to Ellis Island to be deported. There's a court case that is going to become a national headline, really global, uh, in that it exposes how strong this anti-redism and anti-foreignism was in the United States. The two men are seen here, Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, and the man on the right is Sacco, the man on the left is Vanzetti, and it's very likely that they were in fact guilty. I believe they were charged with armed robbery and murder. Uh, however, the jury and the judge were very much uh, vocal about their prejudice for these two men. They were Italians, they were atheists, they were anarchists, and they were draft dodgers. And the judge made a very um, hateful comment towards them and said he would get them if it was the last thing he ever did. So, you know, in, in short, they really should have had that trial thrown out and should have had another trial with a, a non-biased uh, jury and judge. Unfortunately, that did not happen. The two were electrocuted later on. Let's take a look at this cartoon. We're going to use the hip analysis in class. If you want to pause the video, go right ahead. And obviously, its subject matter is similar to what we're talking about just two slides ago. Let's talk about the KKK. Their numbers do increase throughout the early 1920s. Uh, as you can see, they're very popular in the Midwest and the South. Uh, the membership does decline later on in the decade as they are linked to embezzlement, and I do believe a murder as well. But as you can see, they are anti pretty much everything. Um, and so we can think about well, what do they actually, what do they stand for? In their mind, they're a pro Anglo Saxon, they're a pro native born American group, and they're pro Protestant, and they seem to think that they are there to purify American culture and the country in general and to help it return to some wonderful state that has, of course, gone away now that we've had all these changes in our world. And obviously, that's their vision, not mine, so please keep that in mind. Uh, here you can see them demonstrating in Washington, D.C. as they march in front of the Capitol without their masks on, which is quite bold, I would say, as was the entire decade, of course. And here you can see in that same demonstration, they're using, obviously, the Christian symbol of the cross to remind people that this is sort of a, a mission given to them by God. And again, that's how they see it, not me. Let's think about that anti-everything, though, feeling and realize that the United States government was very anti-immigrant. And this is something we'll be talking about pretty much throughout the entire year. And while we already had the Chinese Exclusion Act on the books and we had the Gentleman's Agreement in, in effect, uh, we're going to see now a blanket immigration policy that is specifically directed towards the new immigrants, the folks from Eastern and Southern Europe. And so the Emergency Quota Act 1921 will set a numerical restriction as to how many people can come to this country from each country, and it was set at 3%, uh, and they used the U.S. Census of 1910 to define that. So if 100 people from Italy came in 1910, well then in 1921, now only three could enter the country legally. 
a few years later, you can see they actually reduced that from 3% down to 2%, and they used the 1890 census. So obviously, 2 is less than 3, but keep in mind that in 1890, the new immigration was just kicking up, whereas in 1910, it was in full effect. So again, this further restricts immigration. It's the end of this sort of open-door immigration policy in the U.S., And this cartoon is in our book, right? You can see Uncle Sam sort of uh, reducing the flow of immigrants to the United States. And you can see this here that not all countries were affected equally. Immigrants from Northern and Western Europe, their numbers did not change all that significantly, whereas the new immigrants, you can see, were drastically reduced. about the noble experiment of prohibition. This is a progressive idea, and I did say in the beginning that progressivism is being replaced. Uh, and while this amendment and the Volstead Act, which enforces it, are passed in 1919, it's kind of the fruition of the efforts that preceded that. The temperance movement and the prohibition movement had been an ongoing battle, and so it is going to become law, obviously, but it did not necessarily convince the people to change their behavior. Prohibition was popular in the South. There was a fear that African Americans would be intoxicated and therefore rise up from their uh, position that they've been held in since, since slavery. Also in the West, as alcohol was associated with crime and corruption. But in the East, in the North, in these big cities, people didn't feel that way. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second here. But here, of course, is Al Capone. You all know him, right? And uh, organized crime is going to really blossom as a result of prohibition. And keep in mind that while they used uh, horrible methods for what they did, um, they also found a way to bring a product to the market. There was high demand for alcohol and supply was very short. And so I know from two semesters of economics in college that that means that prices are going to go up. I like this picture of Al Capone better. It's in our book as well. Here he is fishing in Florida. I just need to know where I can get a bathrobe like that. All right, so the federal government does not have a lot of experience in individuals' lives. In fact, that was a fear, I would say, dating back to the beginning of our country and our government in general. And with prohibition, it's no different. You know, How do you force people to follow the law, especially when you don't have enough federal agents to patrol um, cities and to patrol the Great Lakes, for example? I know a lot of alcohol came from Canada and was just shipped across the Great Lakes in that regard. People made it home, too. So there's a problem there, and it sort of becomes a thing. This idea of civil disobedience, of disobeying a law that you do not agree with, it kind of becomes cool. It becomes rebellious, and people want to go to the speakeasies, these sort of underground bars and saloons where you had to know the password to get in. You could be hip if you were able to go to that type of place after hours. And, and that only encourages people to violate prohibition as well. And typically this is in the cities, as I was saying before. Look at this young lady here, a bootlegger, hiding her hooch in her boot. Does she look ashamed for breaking this law? Absolutely not. And again, she's not the only one. It seems to be, you know, quite prolific that people were violating prohibition. And you can see this beat cop in the background here. I know that police officers were not immune to violating prohibition either, nor were politicians. But as I said before, uh, mobsters and organized crime, such as Al Capone and others, will make millions of dollars in profit and, and will be waging warfare against one another to do so. So while they are sort of uh, heroes to people who are looking for alcohol, they're also murdering one another, uh, and of course violating prohibition as well. It's a real problem. Keep, just think for a second, though, on, on how we view organized crime today. You know, most people enjoy a good mob movie, but uh, really we're kind of idolizing murderers and thugs, and I think that's important to point out. Um, following Prohibition, and even during Prohibition, organized crime began to switch over into other activities, as you can see here, uh, and so that's obviously a problem as well. Similarly, not necessarily related to organized crime, but uh, a major crime did occur with the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. He was found soon after. He was actually murdered. Uh, he, the killer had demanded ransom for the baby. And the man who was convicted of this and executed um, to the very end did, you know, he was very adamant that he was innocent. Uh, but a Lindbergh law was passed, and it said that interstate abduction in certain circumstances was a death penalty offense. And that's probably related to sort of the gruesomeness of the crime, but also to the celebrity status of Charles Lindbergh. We'll talk about it here soon.
Yesterday was Valentine's Day, and uh, it's a good time to mention the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, probably the, the most well-known example of gang violence in which uh, some of Capone's men had posed as police officers and lured some unarmed rival gangsters into a warehouse and murdered them ruthlessly, as you can see here. All right, so science and religion, they they have some conflict in the 1920s, we mentioned that, and let's see how that spills over into public education. First of all, understand that states have more of a role in education at the state level. There's also some national changes, perhaps inspired by folks like John Dewey. His book, Experience and Education, did argue that you as the student are going to learn more and uh, remember more about the experience of being in school than you will say for the content that you're actually studying and that teachers should try to create these lifelong learners and, and I certainly believe that and uh, try to take that to my classroom every day. I, one of my colleagues and good friends did once tell me that you know I teach kids I don't teach history and so I, I try to keep that as my general approach. But in terms of the conflict we have those who will believe that the Bible and scripture should be followed literally. It is the word of God according to them and therefore they see more modern views of religion as being you know, contributing to this decay, overall decay in American society. And it seems to be that Darwinism and the ideas of evolution is going to be kind of the catalyst for this real battle. Here's John Scopes. We'll meet him on the next slide as well. Uh, he is actually going to teach evolution in school, despite the fact that it is illegal to do so in the state of Tennessee. And obviously you can see in this cartoon that the uh, creator of this cartoon is sort of building a link between evolution and these other radical ideas. And here is obviously a criticism of Charles Darwin, who was not necessarily, you know, immediately welcomed in the scientific community. Even scientists in his day kind of thought that evolution was a bit far off. All right, so this court case here with John Scopes that I was mentioning before in 1925 is going to be referred to as the monkey trial. And obviously that is sort of mocking the idea of evolution. But he was encouraged by the ACLU to intentionally violate this law against teaching evolution. And probably the reason why is to bring that to the national forefront to make sure that we are aware of this deep division in American society. And, and obviously moving forward, science has made its way fully into public education. And in fact, religion has kind of adopted to incorporate a lot of scientific principles. And so to that extent, the ACLU was, I suppose, successful. Scopes is going to be defended by Clarence Darrow. He is the rock star lawyer of his day. And he's prosecuted by William Jennings Bryan, who is said to be an expert on the Bible and religion. Despite the fact that William Jennings Bryan was made to look the fool by Clarence Darrow, uh, Scopes was found guilty. And in fact, that law is still, or was still on the books until 1967. But again, it showed these deep divisions in American society. And as you can see here, there's a real, a real push to fight this concept of evolution. Let's talk about consumerism and mass consumption. Uh, World War One and Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon's tax policies did bring prosperity. Americans had higher wages, although prices did increase as well with the cost of living. Uh, America enjoyed prosperity throughout the 1920s, and a shift occurs in which people begin to really kind of have this culture of buying and consuming. That is consumerism. And to fuel that, modern advertising emerges. And it's not quite as scandalous as you might see on TV. But if you think about your favorite Super Bowl commercial from last month, you know, how far into the commercial did you have to go before you even realize what the product was? So oftentimes they're using symbols of sex or just humor in general to get you interested in something and then kind of surprise you with it at the end. Advertisement before the 1920s was very black and white. It might name the product and tell you what it did, but it didn't have that sort of um, psychological appeal, I suppose. Sports becomes a big business, which obviously continues into the modern day. You know, athletes begin to uh, receive salaries that are higher than the president of the United States, which obviously is the case today. And people who really want to uh, live this life of consuming uh, are often going to be using credit to purchase a variety of exciting consumer goods like refrigerators and vacuum cleaners. They use a system uh, that's similar to layaway in which you put money down and pay off the remainder of the balance over time. Obviously, this leads to increased personal debt, and especially after the stock market crashes and we begin this you know, global depression. You know, people cannot pay off the debts they have racked up, and therefore we, it only adds to the chaos and panic of the Great Depression.
Here's a good example of some celebrities in advertisement here, uh, advertising for cigarettes. Harry Heilman, the Detroit Tigers. Another one here, uh, this image associated with the Model T, uh, you know, sort of an entrepreneurial, you know, kind of image. And again, all automobiles are presented this way. Think of any Ford truck commercial and the image that it represents or the hybrid car commercial and the image that it represents as well. Speaking of the automobile, you all know that I happen to like automobiles quite a bit by now, probably, but this industry really takes off in the 1920s, and it actually puts industry in general on a new path. And the path is going to be based on this assembly line method and mass production, you know, as quickly as possible. Detroit will become the automobile capital of the world, and Henry Ford will sort of create this idea of a moving assembly line. And our book refers to it as Fordism. I actually never heard of that prior to that. I think if you understand what the, an assembly line is and you can build a link between that and Henry Ford, then you certainly uh, get the concept. But as you see, by 1930, more than 20 million Model Ts were being driven in the country. And you can get it any color you'd like, as long as that was black. Obviously, you all know now that I like automobiles, so I'm going to try to keep this short. But the automobile industry will have a profound impact on other industries, both positive and negative impacts. It helps to kick up petroleum. And just think for a second, your modern vehicle and all of the bits that go into that, uh, everything from your um, GPS and so forth to the touchscreen, all of that technology in addition to the regular bits of a car, the rubber, the glass, and so forth, all of that will grow as a result of the, the growing popularity of the automobile. Whereas the, the railroad, for example, will have a negative impact on it as people start to use automobiles as their chief mode of transportation. It does lead to urban sprawl and eventually the growth of suburbs outside of major cities. And obviously there are traffic incidents that occur, but it does bring more convenience and pleasure and excitement into people's lives. And it, does, it sort of creates an environment for young people to kind of carry out this new popular culture outside of the supervision of their parents and so you know the car removes you from parental supervision and of course that's part of the mystique to it another development in transportation would be aviation right so 1903 the wright brothers make their historic 12 second flight in north carolina a little hop skip and a jump during World War I, planes are used extensively for reconnaissance as well as air-to-air -air combat. But after the war, we could add passenger travel and airmail transportation to that as well. Again, negatively impacting the railroad. Charles Lindbergh, 1927, flies across the Atlantic Ocean. He is a huge megastar in the United States, has the largest ticker tape parade in New York City history. Uh, and he really inspires the country as man is conquering his environment, but also setting out on this adventure of flying across the Atlantic Ocean. And here is the Wright brothers. Not sure I want to get on that plane. And here is Charles Lindbergh and his spirit of St. Louis. And of course, the following year after his historic flight, Amelia Earhart made the same flight. And so, again, you know, inspiring Americans and also challenging gender stereotypes, something we'll talk about later in this presentation. Another huge change to shrink the world would be radio, and it's going to be used at the national level. We'll talk about that in a second here. But by the 1920s now, or at the end of the 1920s, you can kind of consider each family to have one. And as I said in the pageant, I like this, automobiles drew Americans away from the home, but the radio brought them back. Think about that. Your television may be just like, it might be the central focus of your family room or your den or whatever you call that space. And the family could come together to enjoy that. And certainly that's what the radio did. I wonder how they'll discuss this sort of um, cell phone driven, internet driven uh, media center that we have now where individuals actually don't necessarily watch things together. In fact, they might be off in their separate spaces within the house. And here's FDR who uses this masterfully. You can see that he, in his fireside chats, he's able to speak to the entire nation, but he also does that very strategically in terms of the word choice he has and the way he makes you feel as if it's sort of a very you know informal kind of conversation as opposed to the president speaking to you about complicated things that you don't fully understand. A couple of automobiles, just to get back to that, because we mentioned them again. Why not? On the right, we have the Model T. That's the cheaper of the two, obviously. It's pretty much a bare-bones type vehicle, whereas on the left, you see the Model A, which is a bit more luxurious. 
That one was favored by gangsters, by the way, for obvious reasons. Hollywood emerges in the 1920s as well, although movies had been around for quite some time. It was movies like The Great Train Robbery in 1903 and The Birth of a Nation in 1915 that really resemble a more modern movie. Now you can see from the uh, poster on the right there that in The Birth of a Nation, the KKK is central to the plot. In fact, they are the heroes. They ride to town to save the day, a movie that Woodrow Wilson actually uh, believed to be quite the picture. Um, Hollywood quickly becomes the movie capital of the world. They're used extensively in creating this anti-German propaganda during the First World War. Uh, and something the pageant said that I didn't know, uh, these immigrant groups that lived in cities, obviously, you know, they lived in these sort of little enclaves, ethnic uh, neighborhoods, and they typically would go to neighborhood vaudeville shows. But once movies sort of become in vogue, people kind of leave the vaudeville shows and go to see motion pictures, which, of course, are a part of this emerging national popular culture. All right, so more on science and religion, as well as urban versus rural, and this is birth control. And birth control, you know, again, is, a, is something that has made its way into mainstream life in America today, but in the 1920s, it was extremely taboo. So Margaret Sanger is seen as quite radical for her, you know, very vocal support for this. She's radical in other ways as well. She later on does support eugenics. Uh, but in the same sense, she's going to argue, and rightfully so, that women don't really have much protection from their own husbands. There was no protection against marital rape, for example. And early on in the 19th century, at least women couldn't even file for divorce. So you see, as those laws begin to change in the 20th century, the divorce becomes more common. And while that may look like sort of a negative thing, and, and in, in many cases it may be a negative thing, it also is going to allow women to protect themselves uh, and maintain healthy relationships. All right, speaking of women, let's look at some new styles. And everybody has heard of the flapper before, and it's not just a style, it's an outlook, and it's an attitude, and it's bold and defiant, and it's done in public. And so this is a direct challenge to traditional behavior that is expected of women, to traditional gender stereotypes, and it becomes a fashion, so it becomes cool. And obviously, uh, once that happens, it sort of runs away, and everybody, at least in the cities, really uh, kind of gravitate towards this. Again, this is sort of a, a thing for younger people to embrace, and it, I think it scared the heck out of older Americans, as many other things did. But it also exposed this double standard, which obviously exists today. You know, there are certain things that are deemed to be appropriate for males and certain things that are deemed to be appropriate for females, uh, and typically there's a line between that. And, and so uh, that's something we'll talk more about in class. Uh, but in general, this style is associated, again, with this sort of like belief that American society is, is decaying, uh, and there's concerns that young people are irresponsible and reckless, and they're only concerned with fun and pleasures of the flesh, and they disrespect traditions and so forth. The same types of things that uh, we hear older people say about younger people today in uh, 2018. The automobile actually uh, allowed for this kind of behavior to happen as younger people now are going to be outside the supervision of their parents. I think the pageant said that you know prior to the 1920s, uh, kissing someone was like almost as good as getting married. Uh, that that was kind of going to seal the deal, and so things are clearly changing. Uh, Dr. Sigmund Freud, who if you take psychology, you can learn all about him, is also studying sex and sexual repression, and he's going to argue that he was responsible for a variety of emotional problems. So again, a new outlook and new views on some topics that were prior to this very much taboo. And here they are, the flappers, with their bobbed hair and their shorter skirts. They look adorable. And as I said to my other class a few weeks ago, you can buy toddler flapper costumes now. And high school proms have 1920s flappers themes to it. And by our modern standard, there is nothing wrong with that at all. It's totally normal. It's, it's retro and vintage. But in its own day, it was pushing the limits and extremely scandalous. Harlem was a very large and vibrant African-American community in New York City. Uh, and after uh, World War I and this great migration, I think it grew even, even larger. And so what comes out of that is this explosion of African-American culture. And it takes various forms. Uh, jazz, as you can see, is the soundtrack of that. But it includes performing arts as well as visual arts uh, as well. Uh, jazz is something that younger people just really embraced. It's a beat. Um, and it's very complicated, but it's also simple at the same time. I mean, it is about expression. And maybe 
the whole decade is about that. Um, and again, as I said, that you know it reflects this pride. It was a true, authentic African American culture, a Northern African American culture, uh, but it was embraced by younger Americans. Uh, not all African Americans were really interested in sort of this like shared experience. Marcus Garvey, for example, does create the United Negro Improvement Association. And he did promote a back to Africa movement, which failed. He also supported stores uh, and other businesses to, to keep black dollars in black pockets. And so, you know, the idea was to have black shopkeepers uh, and sort of promote this, I guess, merchant class in the North as well. Here's the Cotton Club in New York City. It was a whites only um, club that you can go to to hear jazz. And all of that jazz, by the way, or the vast majority of it was performed and written by African Americans, such as Duke Ellington right here. And that's Marcus Garvey. All right, so if you want to think about this new culture uh, that's emerging, a national culture, obviously it's being challenged by traditional values. It's very modern. And when we say modernism, we're talking about this idea of questioning social conventions, that maybe we should try new things. Uh, and it certainly was present in American literature in the 1920s, and I, and I think it really persist to the modern day. You all are reading uh, Gatsby in English class. I know that. So you have an idea of the style of writing and the types of topics that Gatsby or F. Scott Fitzgerald, I should say, will, will meet head on and will sort of expose in a very authentic and unique way. Ernest Hemingway was also greatly affected by World War I, and he starts to question this ultra-patriotic commitment to the war and really questioning the impact of propaganda as well. We all love Gatsby. But a brief little look at the economy. First of all, anytime you see speculation, you know that we're going to be talking about a recession here. In this case, folks were speculating the stock market. We had a bear market, so it was making a lot of money, and people were making a lot of money off of that, I should say. And so to maximize that, they leveraged those purchases by borrowing more. They bought stock on margin. They put 10% down, borrowed 90%. And they made money until, of course, the market crashed in 1929, and then people were ruined. The Congress in 1921 did try to balance the budget with this Bureau of the Budget. And Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon, just in general, wanted to reduce the national debt, which he did by $10 billion. He did that by shifting the tax burden away from the wealthy to the middle-income group. And the argument was that if the wealthy ha can keep more of their money, then they'll invest it in things like industry as opposed to if they're taxed high taxes, then they'll look for tax-exempt securities to invest in. On this pie chart, you can see that more than half of America's made less than $2,000. And while that may not seem like a lot, um, it's probably more than we think. But there's this growing, you know, fever of consumerism in which Americans want to buy these new goods, like vacuum cleaners and sofas and pianos. How do they do that? How do they have access to those goods? Well, they're going to use credit. They use a system. Uh, it's kind of like layaway. You put down five dollars for a washing machine, and then eight dollars a month until you pay it off. And that's sort of a nice, easy way to give people access to goods. Material goods then and now are a way that we try to demonstrate a socioeconomic status. Whether that's real or perceived, it doesn't matter. Now, I understand if you start blowing up your Finsta with pictures of your new vacuum cleaner, nobody's going to care. But certainly, if you bought yourself a brand new jumbo OLED TV, you'd tell the world. And that's it for tonight. Chapter 31, the third chapter of this week. We've got vacation coming up with a couple more uh, chapters signed over that. So get ready. It'll be fine, as they say, right? Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email or just ask me in class. Take care.